Well, hi and welcome. My name's Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service this morning. Uh, in a little while, we'll be looking at the service of morning prayer that you'll find in the, on page 18 of the Green Prayer Books. But let's start off our service by praising to God together in the words of our first hymn. If you could now take up your green Australian prayer books and turn to page 118. In Revelation 4 we read, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, of course, God is worthy of all praise, but we don't always live up to that, do we? In Daniel 9 we read, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by following his laws which he set before us. And in 1 John we read, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear friends, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our many sins and not to conceal them in the presence of God our Heavenly Father but to confess them with a penitent and obedient heart, so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought always humbly to admit our sins before God, but chiefly when we meet together, to give thanks for the benefits we have received at his hands, to offer the praise that is due to him, to hear his holy word, and to ask what is necessary for the body as well as for the soul. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of our gracious God and say these words together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises declared to mankind in Jesus Christ our Lord, and grant merciful Father for his sake that we may live a godly and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ pardons and absolves all who truly repent and believe his holy gospel. For God desires not the death of a sinner, but rather they should turn from their wickedness and live and has given authority and commandment to his ministers to declare to his people, when they repent, the forgiveness of their sins. Therefore let us ask God to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that what we do now may please him 
and the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, so that in the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Open our lips, O Lord, and we shall declare your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Let us praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Will you join with me as we say together the words of Psalm 95, which you'll find on page 22 of the prayer book. O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as Israel did in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, put me to proof, though they had seen my works, of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. We're going to hear from God's word now. The first reading is from Psalm 40 beginning at the first verse. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The the things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and a sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not steal my lips, do not seal my lips. As you know, O Lord, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me, for troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, Aha! Aha! be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love you your salvation, always say, The Lord is exalted. Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. This is the word of God. Uh, The reading this morning is taken from Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, before we look further into God's word and into those readings, will you join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find on page 26 of the prayer book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, sooner or later, suffering is going to touch us all. It may be through mental illness. Some 70% of people in churches will be touched by mental illness in some way or another. Uh, it may be grief at the loss of a loved one. It may be through personal pain or through sickness. Well, today we're going to be addressing the question, looking at the question that will never go away. Where is God in the midst of all this? He can seem so distant we might pray and pray, and yet there is no answer. So where is he? As we do that, I'm going to try and answer this question. Um, I can guarantee you that this sermon is going to be twice as good as any other Anglican sermon that you'll hear. Basically because all other Anglican sermons have only got three points, and I've got six points. Um, but never fear, there'll, there'll be short points, um, and I hope to try and help you to remember them as we go along. And the first point is this. The first question, the question is, where's God in mental illness? So the first part of the answer um, is that God is always where he, is where he always is, where he always has been. God is always, always has been and always will be in control. In Malachi 3 verse 6, um, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. In Hebrews 13 verse 8, we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. No matter what we feel about God, the reality doesn't change. He is still the creator and sustainer of all things. In Colossians 1 verse 16, talking about Jesus, um, for by him all things were created. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. In times of sadness, grief, depression, anxiety and pain, it can feel like God has lost control of the wheel somehow. But do not be afraid, God is still sovereign and in control. Isaiah goes this far in, in Isaiah 45 verse 7. He says, I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. In other words, God is in control even when bad things happen. Of course, we know that bad things have come into our world as a consequence of the fall, as a consequence of our sin. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, our world has been plunged into darkness and judgment. We tried to push God out of our lives 
And so God has given us the consequence of our sin. That is why we have depression and anxiety and Alzheimer's and cancer and death. It doesn't mean that God's lost control. His self-control has never changed and neither has his love for us. Over and over in the scriptures, they, we are reminded of God's love. In Psalm 103 verse 11, we're reminded that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear him. In John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrates in love, his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 8 verse 38, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love is so unshakable, so powerful, nothing can shift it. God is where he always is. He will never change. And it's because of his great love that we know the second thing, that God weeps with us. God weeps with us. When we look at the pain in our lives and the lives of the ones that we love and the world at large, we weep, don't we? I mean, we could, when you watch videos of children starving in Ethiopia, how can you watch that and not be moved? Who can sit with a friend who's crippled with a depression or anxiety, um, so, so much so they can't even go outside and, and, and not be grieved? Who can hear of another teenager taking their life and, and, and not be moved to tears? Well, if we can feel for the ones we love, and even for those that we don't know, how much more is God moved by our pain? In, Romans, in John chapter 11, when Jesus comes to Bethany, to the home of his good friends Mary and Martha, at the time of their brother's death, what does he do? He goes to the tomb, and in verse 35 we read, he weeps. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem in Luke 19, verse 41, he looks out over the helpless and the lost, and what does he do? Again, he weeps. In Romans 8, uh, when Paul speaks of our groaning world in verse 22 and, and how we, in fact, groan along with it in verse 23, he reminds us in verse 27 that where we can't even manage to let our, our words out, the Spirit speaks for us in groans that words cannot express. Oftentimes, um, people who are in pain don't want someone to come in and solve their problems. Uh, they really just want someone to come in and feel it with them to empathise with them. And that is what God does with us. He weeps with us. He weeps that our world is like it is. We see some of the pain in our world, and we find that hard enough, but God sees all of the pain of all of the people all the time. He knows the world is not the safe and secure place it was, it was built to be. In uh, Genesis chapter 6, when God sees the, the, uh, the corruption in the world of Noah's time, he is grieved, he is distressed. He hates to see the way we hurt each other. He hates to see us going through pain. He understands the pain of depression and anxiety and dementia. But how can he? How can he know what it's like? God sits up there in his heavenly high tower, untouched by the problems that we experience. Well, of course, we know that he knows what it's like because he has been there. He has been there before us. He was one of us. Jesus stood where we stand. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read that the word became flesh. The eternal word that was there from the beginning becomes flesh. Flesh and blood becomes weak, becomes insignificant. And what kind of world did he come into? He came into a world where, where babies are killed at the, at the whim of a, uh, of a um, ridiculous leader. He comes in the world and lives as a refugee. He knows what it is to, be su to suffer. He knows what it is to feel alone, to be abandoned. He doesn't stand aloof. He understands God has suffered. In Philippians 2 verse 6, we're told that being in very nature God... Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped hold of, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
We, we can never accuse God of sitting in his ivory tower and not understanding our pain. Jesus gave up all the glory of heaven to, in order to suffer in ways that we can hardly even imagine. He has experienced the pain that we have experienced. The writer of the Hebrews in chapter 4 verse 15 says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. God became one of us. Jesus was there. He did this because he dearly loves us. You see, God's love it doesn't just show itself in pity from a distance. No, his love is so great that he comes and ex experiences our pain with us. We know, may not understand what God is doing, but we can never doubt his motives. He empathises completely with what we're going through because he has been there. But of course, he didn't just come down, experience that, and then disappear and leave us to our own devices. He also promises to stick with us, to walk alongside us in our pain. And so the fourth uh, answer to that question is that God is with us. You see, when you're in the midst of depression, anxiety, and other mental illness, and actually, no matter what you're going through, it may feel like God has left you, that he's abandoned you to your fate. But that couldn't be further from the truth. In Psalm 23, the passage that, uh, that Greg had read for, that we read with Greg, uh, we read, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In Isaiah 43, God promises, When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. In Matthew 28, Jesus says to his disciples, I will be with you always. To the very end of the age. And in Hebrews 13 verse 5, uh, again we're promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. When Jesus promises to be with us, we can believe it, we can trust him. He will always be here with us. Which is why, of course, prayer is such an important resource for those who suffer from mental illness or, or indeed any suffering. You see, it's not just some psychological effect like mindfulness which focuses our minds on something outside our problems. It does do that, but it's actually more than that. It's a conversation with someone who is actually with you, who loves you, who understands what you're going through and has the power and the desire to help you. Prayer changes things, and prayer changes us. It does this because God is really with us. Incidentally, I was um, listening to um, Philip Yancey, who's an American author, who wrote a book, uh, amongst others, which is uh, called Where, Where Is God When It Hurts? Um, he rec certainly recognises and grapples with the difficulty of this question, where is God? He recognises it's a hard issue that all Christians must come to grips with. But he also, uh, in this interview, asked the question, where is no God in times of suffering? In other words, what does a belief in no God bring to this whole issue? The answer is nothing, perhaps worse than nothing. You see, if life is just some freak collection of happy accidents with no meaning or purpose, then my depression is just tough luck, really. Um, your anxiety is meaningless. The humanist worldview offers no comfort or hope. You and I are on our own. There's nothing and no one to help us, no one to give us value, no one to stand with us. Sad indeed. Yes, it can be hard to answer the question, where is God in all this? But we've been reminded that so far, so far that God is still on his throne, his love for us has not changed, that he weeps with us. He has stood where we stand and he is with us. As if that was not enough, we also had the promise that he is at work in us. Now I need to be careful, I, be, I want to be I kind of say this point with great fear and trepidation because I don't want to come across uh, as someone who's just saying, look, in your depression, in your anxiety, in your mental illness or whatever it is you're going through, um, you're just so lucky because uh, God must be doing something great in you. Or to, you know, there's, just, look, for, look for the silver lining. But in Romans 8.28, we are told that we, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. God is at work for us in the good times and even in the bad times, how could he possibly be at work? Well, here's, here's three possible ways that God can be at work in us. 
I'm not saying this is, the, this is always the case, um, but these things can be true for us. First way is that he is changing us. You see, we live in a culture that tells us from the moment we, uh, we can switch on a TV or open an iPad that the greatest good in our lives is our own pleasure, our own comfort. But the truth is, there is so much more to life than that. It's much more important the kind of person we are than the amount of things that we achieve or, or even the comfort we experience. God can work even in our hardship to do good for us. He's shown that on Good Friday, we remember the day when the, the, we remember the worst event that's ever happened, the killing of God's son. But God can actually turn that around for good, for the salvation of that world. And so too in our hardship, God is at work in us to change us to be more like Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, Paul reminds us, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul, who wrote those words, knew suffering, but he also realised that God can even work through uh, the things that we, we have to go through to achieve something much greater. Peter says the same thing when he writes to a whole community that's un, under the, the threat of persecution. In 1 Peter 1 verse 6, he says, For a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ in reveal, is revealed. God is working in us to prove our, to to sharpen our faith, to strengthen our faith, even in hardship. And Jesus, James, Jesus' brother James says something similar in James chapter one, verses two to four. He says, "Consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything." You see, these Bible writers aren't trying to trivialise our pain. They know it firsthand all too well. But they are laying before us the hope that we can find meaning in the midst of our suffering because God can even use these hard times for our good. So God is at work in us, um, changing us, but he's also at work in us giving credit where it is due. You see, we tend to think of the apostles as people who had it all together. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Paul was all too aware of his own weaknesses and experienced more than his fair share of suffering. But listen to how he reflects on his own weakness in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. He says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He says a similar thing in 1 Corinthians 1 uh, when he says, God chose the weak things of this earth to shame the strong so that we might see God's strength at power at work. One of the things that God can be doing as he works in us is actually bringing glory to himself. That as, we, as he works through our weaknesses, we can see the power of God shine all the more clearly. clearly. You may have read the story of Joni Erickson, the, the, the girl who was uh, paralysed as a teenager, became a quadriplegic, um, but has gone on in her life to, to, uh, to impact many people for the gospel. Some of you will know Nick Vujicic, um, the Australian man who was born with no arms and no legs, who, whose faith shines out to those, uh, to those who have gone through suffering. And we've all been encouraged, haven't we, over the recent weeks as we've watched videos and, and heard testimonies of those who have been through difficulties. You see, God is able to, to use our weakness and our pain for the glory of his name. It can actually open up opportunities for us to care for others who have been in the same situation. Um, it, what, uh, opportunities that may never have opened up to us otherwise. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4 he says, He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. Which of course leads us to the third thing, third way that God can be at work in us. Um, God is at work in us as we care for the hurting. Again, according to Philip Yancey, um, one of the answers to the question, where is God when it hurts, is to ask another question. Where is the church when it hurts? You see, the church should be on the front line of, of suffering. 
there caring for those who are in need. Because when people see the church, they will see God at work. We are his hands and his feet, his instruments. In John 13, verse 14, having washed his disciples' feet, he turns to them and says, Now I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. We are to carry on his work. Jesus spent his life caring for others, and now he wants us to do the same. Um, People don't need our platitudes, they need our presence, they need our love and our practical help. We can offer real and practical help to those in need, and as we do so, that is God at work in us. What an amazing privilege that is. We think a little bit more about this next week. So in answer to our question, where is God in mental illness? We've seen five answers so far. He is where he has always been, in control and loving us. He is weeping with us. He has stood where we, has, we stand. And he is always with us. Finally, he is at work in us. But there's one more answer to this question, and this is a big one. You see, because God is with us, because, because he weeps with us, because he sees this world as not as it should be, he also promises that one day he will put it all to right. It may seem to us God is bringing us to his glory. It may seem to us that this dark cave that we are in will never be in, will never let in any light. There's no hope, no future, uh, no reason to go on. But God says, no, there is hope. There is a future. One day, all this suffering, all this sadness, all this depression, anxiety and fear will be taken away forever. Revelation 21 verse 4 is that beautiful verse. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. All the suffering that we experience will not be there when Christ returns. It will be removed. And Paul gives us this great hope for, for our, ourselves, our souls and our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42, he says, The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. We have a future that, is, that doesn't include the weakness of our depression or anxiety or mental illness or our physical illness. All those things will be done away with. But when we are raised with Christ, our, our bodies will be glorious. All the weakness, all the frailties will be taken away. Paul says in, again in Romans 8, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be, re- will be revealed in us. However bad our life is at the moment, it pales into insignificance to our future. Christ will bring us to glory. No matter how bad life is here and now, we can take great comfort and solace in the promise that one day Jesus will return and it will all be changed. We will be changed. And we won't have to put up with any of that pain, any of that suffering anymore. So, where is the God in the midst of mental illness, indeed in any types of suffering? Well, I wonder if you can remember those six things. Where is God? Well, he is where he has always been. He is in control and, he's, and full of love for us. He feels our pain and he weeps with us. He understands our pain because he has been there. He is also with us. He is alongside us, bringing us comfort and strength. He is at work in us for, for our good and for his glory. And finally, he's promising that when he comes again, all will be made right. So don't give up on him. Turn to him, cling to him, receive his comfort, love and hope. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who are suffering right now and all those who will suffer in the future. It's all of us. Lord, we know that even though it may seem like you are distant, Father, we thank you for this great promise that no matter what we're going through, that you are still God. You are still in control. Your love is still for us. 
We thank you, Lord, that you feel our pain, that you weep with us. We know that because you've been, you have been here, you've experienced it yourself, and now you are alongside us to bring us comfort and strength. We thank you, Lord, that you are also at work in us, even in the bad times. May that give us comfort and solace. And finally, Lord, we thank you for promising a future and a hope, one that can, be never, that can never be taken away despite what we go through. Lord, help us to hold on to these truths that we might hold on to you. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would bring healing, you would bring comfort, bring strength, bring us to perfection in Christ, we pray. For it's his, it's his name we pray. Amen. Well, in response to what we've heard from God's word, let's turn to page 27 and let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, show us your mercy and grant us your salvation. Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear our prayers. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and make your chosen people joyful. Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, for you are our help and strength. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. O God, the author and lover of peace, in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, your servants, in all, our, all assaults of our enemies, that surely trusting in your defence, we may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us by your mighty power and grant that today we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger but lead and govern us in all things, that we may always do what is righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our prayers continue on page 34. Almighty God, the foundation of all goodness, and we humbly pray you to bless our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth, and all who hold public office in this land, that all things may be ordered in wisdom, righteousness and peace to the honour of your holy name and the good of your church and people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, you alone work great marvels. Send down your spirit of saving grace on all Christian people, especially on our Archbishop Kanishka and our Regional Bishop Peter, other pastors and the congregations in their care, that they may truly please you Pour upon them the continual dew of your blessing. Grant this, Lord, in the, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all people. O God, creator and reserver of all mankind, we humbly pray for all sorts and conditions of men, that you will be pleased to make your way known to them, your saving power among all nations. Especially we pray for the welfare of your Catholic Church, that it may be guided and governed by your good spirit, so that all who profess to call themselves Christian may be led into the way of truth and hold the, f the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. We commend to your fatherly goodness all who are in any way afflicted or distressed. You might like to just bring now quietly in the quiet of your heart those known to you who are suffering. We commend all of these people to you, that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their needs. Give them patience in their sufferings, 
and happy issue out of all their afflictions. All this we ask for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Will you join with me in the, the general thanksgiving at the bottom of page 35? Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your amazing love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be truly thankful and that we may declare your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by, by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you join with me in the grace? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be amongst you, be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for our service today. I hope you've been encouraged and challenged um, to live out your life, your faith in Christ this week. Let's finish off our service by singing our final hymn together. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.